Cool. So we'll we'll get started here. Uh, uh, Nicolas Nikov um, works, I think, in a domain where doing open science seems really, really hard. It's like quantitative MRI still, I think, remains very proprietary and closed and just really tricky to do this kind That's of work. Okay? And uh, he's done over the years, he's done a bunch of things around sort of open data and open methods, but also around science communication. And uh, Bill, tell us about all of those different things today. Take it away. Thank you so much, Ariel, for the introduction, for setting up how difficult this uh, talk is to prepare, <laughs> and uh, also for the kind invite. It's uh, always good to be uh, back in Seattle. Uh, so uh, the title of the talk is Reproducibility and the Future of Quantitative MRI Research. But I realize that uh, you know quantitative MRI might not be very familiar with uh, for many of you. So I will try to set the stage, explain what it is, and why reproducibility is very important for this particular field. Um, now, I'm currently a professor at uh, Ecole Polytechnique at the University of Montreal. I also have an affiliation with uh, uh, the university in my home country, which is Macedonia. And uh, maybe I can tell you a little bit about myself and my career path first. Uh, by the way, I did read all of your introductions on Slack, so I have an idea of who you are and the wide backgrounds uh, that uh, have come together. Congratulations, Noah and Ariel. This is really an impressive group. Uh, and by the way, I have liked each of your introductions, so uh, you know that I've seen it. Uh, now about me. Uh, let me start with this picture that I just dug up like a month ago when I found out I'm going to Seattle. This is actually my first time in Seattle in 96 at a math fest, like a math camp that happened here on this campus. And this is almost 30 years ago. And uh, this math camp actually played a big role in my career because this is where uh, a, a friend that was at the camp advised me to apply to Stanford. Can you go so, uh, on Zoom your slide presenter? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I Let's see. It's possible to... Yeah, sometimes, maybe if I try to just share the entire screen, yeah, that sometimes gets rid of the problem. Yeah, so let me just share the screen. Share mm -hmm. sound. Uh, can you tell us now if you're seeing everything? Hey, that looks great. Yeah, okay, it does perfect. look great. Excellent. Uh, so this is the 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 uh, ID that I had from back thirty years ago on this very campus, and uh, the advice to apply to Stanford came from a friend at this camp. So sometimes you know, just even spending a little time at the University of Washington can really change your career, and uh, maybe some of you will experience that. And then eventually, I made it to Stanford. I was there for twelve years. Uh, I did my undergrad, my master's, my PhD. Um, and I was in this lab called the MRSRL, the Magnetic System Resonance Systems Research Laboratory. This is the birthday celebration for Al Makovsky. Al is uh, uh, here in the middle. This was his 90th birthday celebration. And then uh, here is uh, Dwight Nishimura. Some of you might have heard about him because he teaches this uh, course on MRI, uh, introductory course on MRI. Uh, John Polly, my PhD supervisor. And then there's me, uh, my family. And uh, the one thing that I will show as a formula is more as a metaphor. Uh, and that is that people take their time in this lab. I was there for a long time, uh, about seven years from the beginning of my PhD till the end. Uh, and that's because we are given this luxury of actually not being required to publish a lot and being given the freedom to explore. So in MRI, uh, if you know the physics, the signal to noise ratio is proportional to the square root of the time that you spend imaging. So take that with a you know slightly metaphorical lens. Basically, you take your time and hopefully something good comes out of it. And uh, as a matter of fact, lots of good things came out of it, but not a single academic paper. I got my PhD from Stanford without ever having published in a journal, zero. <laughs> and uh, let me just tell you what happened afterwards. Uh, at Stanford, I was working with the psychology folks. So Ariel knows them, Brian Wendell, Bob Duggerty. They were very interested in characterizing myelin. And then we were developing some techniques for measuring myelin uh, using magnetization transfer. And uh, it was interesting work. I really enjoyed it. And I never uh, felt that pressure that the papers have to come out. So in the end, we talked about measuring the G ratio, but we never did. And this G ratio work is not in my PhD thesis. But eventually, I did get it out in Neuroimage. This is the first publication, came out in 2011, so more than a year after I got my PhD. 
And then things really snowballed. So you see here in the original one, this is Stanford folks. Uh, and then I went to McGill. I did my postdoc there and actually did some experiments on macaques, on synomalgous macaques, uh, where we validated a lot of this uh, methodology. Now, I don't want to explain too much about what the G ratio is. It's basically, it's a measure of myelin integrity, the myelin thickness. Uh, and this is not a talk about the G ratio, but uh, Jack Van Horn uh, reached out to me and said that they're interested in this work. So it's really cool to see it uh, still survive uh, after that many years. Uh, we shared the data, we shared the code. Uh, and then we wrote this review article about promise and pitfalls of G ratio estimation with MRI. And if you ask me, even this is too many papers, uh, I would like this to be a single paper. Here's my pre-registration, happened at Stanford, purely theoretical. We said we could measure the G ratio. Here's the experimental validation, the sharing of the data and the code, and finally wrapping up the story and telling you why we think it's important and why there's big problems with it. But at some point, even I have to compromise because I had to get a faculty position and get tenure. Uh, but uh, if you want to read about my frustration with the way we publish our work, this is uh, on my Substack. I occasionally publish there, uh, and it's called my 10-year battle with 10-page PDFs. I wrote it after I became promoted to associate professor, so I felt like now I can <laughs> let go. Uh, and just this uh, summer, I'm actually promoted to full professor. So I don't think it's hurt me in the long run, even though it was definitely you know, a challenge uh, doing this uh, <laughs> early on in my career. But if you're curious, uh, you can go to that link and uh, read the whole story. So what have I been doing because I haven't been publishing papers? <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of things and I, I, I enjoy doing these things. Like I, I, hope, I hope that the enthusiasm will come through in this talk, but also for me, it's important just to engage with students at a level that's more kind of like, let's screw around and find out, you know, like who knows what's gonna come out. And as long as I bring somebody who has the enthusiasm, who has the passion, usually good things happen because that's the spirit that my original Stanford lab instilled in me. So I have done some work for journals. I was on the editorial board of the journal Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. Uh, I was also a guest editor for Neuroimage for this special issue on microstructure. This was quite some time ago. Uh, I haven't been that active in uh, 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 journals uh, recently, and you will see why. Uh, but then I also did a lot of science outreach. We started the blog of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This is 2016. I was the first captain of that blog. Um, I started the blog of the ISMRN, the International Society for Magnetic Resonance. Um, we also started this initiative called Magnetic Resonance in Medicine Highlights. Uh, we throw parties at the ISMRM conference. We interview people uh, that work and publish in the journal MRM. And uh, we have a lot of volunteers that contribute. Uh, then I'm also in the steering committee of this uh, uh, grant called the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, CONP. Uh, I started a network of uh, Balkan researchers. My region, Macedonia, is in the Balkans. It's called mrbalkan.net. We've organized conferences in Macedonia, Turkey, Slovenia, Bulgaria. Um, and I'm also on the steering committee of the Quebec Bioimaging Network. Uh, so you know, it keeps me busy, but more than anything, keeps me excited about the work I do. So now we get to the structure of the talk. Um, I want to talk about four things. Eventually, they all will circulate around quantitative MRI. But before I introduce the concept, I just want to tell you a couple of words about reproducibility. Now, I know you've heard from Russ about reproducibility. Mm -hmm. He spoke about fMRI. fMRI is a type of quantitative MRI, uh, but I'll try to take a zoomed out uh, uh, picture. Uh, and I'll start with an editorial that we wrote in 2019 called Reproducibility and the Future of MRI Research. So as you can see, uh, the title of this talk is The Future of Quantitative MRI Research. But uh, maybe I can just set the stage by telling you that the questions surrounding open science and research transparency are particularly le relevant for fields like MR, in which much of the innovation over the past 50 years has been driven by intellectual property, including patents and copyrighted software. And there is a tight link between industry and academia. So as Ariel said, this makes it difficult to do open science. However, the widespread use of many now commonplace MRI technical methods, such as the non-uniform fast Fourier transform, and compressed sensing or compressive sampling can in part be attributed to their authors foresight into the long-term benefits of promoting reproducible research by making their methods publicly available. And these are two articles that are very early on showing how MRI can be done transparently. And maybe some of you have heard about the compressed sensing work that came from Mickey Lustig at Stanford. He's a professor at Berkeley at the moment. And this article here 
is actually the most cited article in the history of the journal Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. Now, I happen to have a small footnote and an acknowledgement in that paper that I'm very proud of because I read it many times helping Mickey write it. And that may have been my biggest contribution to Magnetic Resonance, uh, just a footnote, but an important one, I think. But it did inspire me to try to do this. Take your time with writing a paper until it's ready to come out. That paper, by the way, was Mickey's first paper in his PhD, and it took him four years to write. So there is a common viewpoint that open science is necessarily incompatible with the protection of intellectual property. However, even the etymology of the word patent implies openness. And historically, patents have offered an important alternative to companies hoarding trade secrets. Now, this is something that we don't talk much about. Many people say, I don't patent because I do open science. But in reality, patents are a way of making your science open. Sometimes you have to pay for it. But the transparency and the reproducibility that patents provide is not a bad thing if we're talking about the reproducibility of the work. Uh, surprisingly, in my language, patent actually means zipper. So the etymology means openness. And uh, I am not against them. I personally do not patent. But I'd much prefer that somebody patent and showed what they did instead of just showing it as a black box and then we're really not sure what the inventor was thinking of doing. So this editorial got a lot of attention. It was a collaboration between a couple of different institutions and a couple of different outreach initiatives. We had like a Zoom call in the pandemic with lots of people you may recognize here, Peter Bandettini, Peter Jezzard, Matt Bernstein. Um, and uh, the nicest thing that happened is Three years later, when we took a look at the number of papers that have shared code or data in 2019, when this uh, editorial came out in 2020 and 2021, the trend was obvious. People started sharing more data and code. So can't take full credit for it, but I think we did ride that wave and we convinced people that actually sharing things is to the benefit of everybody, including the reviewers, including the people reading your manuscript. As an aside, this is something that uh, you may be surprised to learn. But in this particular journal, Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, uh, MATLAB is still the dominant language. So you will see here that about two thirds of the articles that shared code, the code was in MATLAB. And there is a trend, Python is gaining ground, but it's still a two to one ratio with C++ and Julia being you know, pre represented. And keep that in mind. Uh, I want to keep this talk very platform agnostic. There will be lots of different uh, uh, data and code examples, but I will try to do it in a way that hides the complexity and shows you how, in the end, maybe we shouldn't care. Use MATLAB as well as there's good reasons to use Python. Uh, in the end, it's more, what is the user experience? Can we make this easy, seamless for other people to reproduce? That's the angle that I'm gonna take. So now we get to the problem of MRI as a measurement device. Every time you talk about MRI and numbers, it implies that these numbers are something that we can reproduce, such as temperature of the human body. We have a thermometer and we know what the right number should be to determine if we have a fever or not. Well, it turns out that the MRI scanner is not a measurement device. Now, I say this very bluntly because the manufacturer says it bluntly. If you take a look at the manual for the magnetome, that's a Siemens system. In it, it explicitly says that the magnetome is not a measurement de device as defined by the medical product guidelines. Measured values obtained are for informational purposes and cannot be used only as the basis for diagnosis. So that's a problem because we have been using it as a measurement device. And especially in the age of AI, we treat MR as data, not necessarily as pictures. Now imagine how much of a problem there is if this data is not standardized and you feed it into AI models and you try to make diagnosis. Uh, so the question is, can we turn MRI into a measurement device? So I usually use this analogy where I talk about conventional MRI as a spoonful from an alphabet soup of contrast mechanisms. You have the T1 contrast, the T2 contrast, the proton density, the magnetization transfer, each of these has different reasons, different underlying physics, but in the end, they're the contrast mechanisms that give you the picture. And the picture looks like this. We call it T1 weighted if it's dominated by the T1 parameter in the measurement. Uh, this is a digital image, except the numbers there are difficult to interpret. Basically, it's just like a picture on your iPhone. And uh, the difference is 
a bento box of contrast mechanisms where each contrast is nicely compartmentalized. So if I can take a look at the T1 parameter, for example, right here, and I can create a map, then we're going to call this a T1 map where there's units. The units are absolute, they're seconds. And ideally, these units will be reproducible within a subject, across subjects, and across sets. <clears throat> So now I want to show you a video that I had a lot of fun making with my kids during the pandemic. Except the sound is not there. Let's see if I can. So this may be because the sound is only fed on Zoom. I like to tell to convince people that uh, quantitative MRI is useful, but I do have some confessions to make. In reality, that beautiful bento box that you saw, well, it's actually a black box. And uh, looking at such a black box is not very easy. Now, if only vendors would join forces on a common platform to help us speak inside the black bento box. The compartments are still there, but it's going to be difficult to see them. And hopefully, we can develop some techniques that will get us to agree. Unfortunately, such a platform doesn't exist. And as far as the vendors are concerned, that was just a green screen, and we are left in the dark. Okay. So well, that was uh, with the help of my kids, who are now much older. But uh, you can imagine that was a nice pandemic activity. Uh, if you want to hear more about the history of these black boxes, uh, I've written another thing on my Substack. It's called the Relaxometry Hype Cycle, um, and uh, basically explains how patents kind of cornered MRI into becoming not a measurement device, because the original MRI patents were by Demadian, Raymond Demadian, who actually wanted to measure T1, and he had so many patents that when GE developed their own scanner, they infringed on those patents. And then to avoid infringing, they said, no, 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 we're not measuring T1. And uh, for those that haven't seen a hype cycle, this is kind of like a general graph uh, where you go through several stages. First, there is this kind of innovation trigger that gets people excited. Uh, then there is the peak of inflated expectations. That's right here in the middle. And then there is a trough of disillusionment because people realize, oh, this is not going to work. And then eventually somebody finds a way to make it work and make it useful. And then you get to the slope of enlightenment. And finally, you reach maturity. So I just took a look at my citations for the G-ratio work that, as I told you, made my career. And check that out. Like, this is really a beautiful hype cycle graph. Uh, I don't know if my Zoom will now work, but you see that graph? That's kind of, you know, the, the, the trigger, the peak of expectations, a trough of disillusionment, myself included. <laughs> and I haven't done G-ratio imaging since this trough, but now other people are picking it up. And this is great because it shows how you know science advances incrementally. And usually when it survives you, yeah, that's the best feeling. I'm no longer a G-ratio researcher, but G-ratio lives on. So it's pretty cool. Um, and I will tell you why I stopped doing it and hopefully why I can get back to it at some point. So again, if you want to read that, that's a QR code. You can uh, check it out. So now I'm going to explain one particular quantitative MRI parameter, because it's a very broad field, and I feel that we need to zoom in on one parameter. And even if you don't know MR physics, just believe me that MRI is driven by two con constants, T1 and T2. T1 is called the longitudinal relaxation. T2 is called the transverse relaxation. And these are important to measure. They're fundamental MRI quantities. Well except that there wasn't a gold standard for measuring this T1 until a colleague at Stanford, Joel Baral, who's currently at Google actually, uh, wrote a gold standard paper and said, this is how we're gonna measure T1. Uh, and this is the very first paper on which I was included as a co-author. And then four, five years later, uh, I wrote something called on the accuracy of T1 mapping, searching for common ground. And what I showed in that paper is that the values of T1 in literature vary by a lot. Oops, I think I stepped on something. Let's see. OK, there it is. So this is the T1 parameter at 3 Tesla and white matter. It should be a very exact, a very sharp number. 
And yet these are seven studies who looked at T1, F3 Tesla and white matter using three different techniques, inversion recovery, loop locker and VFA. Forget about them, doesn't matter what they are. What I want you to notice is that the values of T1 vary from 690 all the way to 1100. That's a variability about 60, 70%. So how can we even dare to call this quantitative MRI? Now we thought, well, maybe this is because it's different papers, different techniques. What if we did it in the same scanner, in the same session, in the same subject? And still, this is what we obtained. This held out across 10 different subjects, the gold standard in the middle, the look locker approach, underestimating and the variable flip angle, overestimating the T1 value. And this change here is about 30%. 30% is too much. Imagine measuring fever and having a variability of 30%. So um, once we published that, other papers followed up and said, yeah, that's true. There is a problem with the reproducibility of T1 at three Tesla. For example, this work coming from the University of Zurich, where they observed a bias in the comparison between T1 relaxation times, eight to 10% higher on average when calculated on the Philips scanner compared to the Siemens scanner. Eight to 10%, maybe something we can live with, but obviously it's a vendor difference. And then upgrades. Uh, if you haven't dealt with a scanner upgrade, you know how frustrating it can be because all of a sudden everything gets miscalibrated. And uh, this is work coming from the NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, the place that has the atomic clock, they have a unit for quantitative MRI, and they showed that there was a variability from five to 30% after a scanner upgrade. So we need to deal with this if we're ever to turn MRI into a measurement device. So we said, let's try this with our scanner. We upgraded it, we had to, and then we observed the same thing. The variability, original and post upgrade was on the order of about 30%. And uh, this is solvable, but it requires the collaboration. It co requires collaboration of researchers and it requires collaboration of vendors. So um, this is a challenge that we just finished. Uh, we were working on it for five years. Okay, so this was announced in 2019. So, you know, getting back to why I don't write papers because I take five years to write a paper. Um, and this was led by Matthew Boudreau. He's a software developer in our lab. And uh, we basically took this gold standard T1 mapping paper that was published by Joel Baral. And then we said, we're not gonna give you anything more, just the paper description, interpret it how you will and acquire T1 maps in phantoms, which are these test objects that we use to validate MRI measurements and in humans. And we got 19 participants who gave us 41 phantom data sets and 56 human data sets. Almost all of them at three Tesla. There was one at 350 millitesla. And three vendors were represented, GE, Philips, and Siemens. And then we organized this in a very nice dashboard that I will show you in a bit. Uh, here you will see the collaborators that uh, submitted data. Uh, this is the dashboard, it's a screenshot. Uh, I will demo it in a bit. And then we submitted this as an abstract in 2023. It got a lot of attention from the community. It was one of the top 100 abstracts at the conference. Uh, eventually we published something called paper is not enough crowdsourcing the T1 mapping common ground. So why is paper not enough? Because in green here, you will see the variability when sites did not coordinate between each other. The T1 values were pretty broad. In orange, you will see the sites that shared something. When they talked to each other about the protocol, when they had the same person conducting the scans, that made a big difference. So we showed that statistically, the paper is not enough because the green is obviously much broader than the orange. But then we also speculated a little bit about what would be needed. And if we did a challenge like this next, what do we give you to ensure that you know, the paper is properly supplemented? So this is the moment where I want to give you a, a, a demo of this paper. I'm really proud of it. Uh, and I think it has some features that you may not have seen in a paper before. So you'll hear about NeuroLibre a couple of times. It's a preprint server for reproducible research objects. Uh, and if you, you know, have a hard time wrapping your head around it, let me just tell you, it's kind of like archive, except we also share the code and the data. So here's the paper is not enough preprint. It gives you a PDF. If you want to cite it, if you want to print it, that's fine. But everything here 
is documented so that it's really easy to take the data and the code and to reproduce it in a browser. So Jupyter Notebooks come in, Docker containers come into this, but you haven't learned about those. Ariel is going to teach about them tomorrow. Uh, but the whole point is you don't need to know about these things. So let me show you something, and then maybe I can also answer questions. So when I click on reproducible preprint, something loads. And uh, what looks, it's just like a normal paper, right? I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing really fancy there, except the figures are interactive. So I can click to show the code that generated those figures. Here's the dashboard. It actually won an award from the company Plotly that develops these visualizations. How many of you have heard of Plotly? I'm just curious. Well, quite a few, okay. So basically, you know, here's all the contributors and here's the phantom data and you can click on a sphere and you can remove G, E and Phillips. You, if you want to look at uh, Siemens and then you can zoom in or out, you can analyze by site, you can have a summary data, you can look at the brain and uh, you can see that uh, different regions, for example, white matter there varies by quite a lot depending on sites. The variability is smaller if you only look at Siemens and so on. And something that I'm particularly proud of, if you click on this arrow here, the rocket, you will launch a binder hub that will actually execute this Jupyter notebook in a browser, taking care of all of the dependencies that took that went into the analysis. Now, this will take a while, but I will be talking over it. And then at the end of the day today, I want us also to stress test this server with another Jupyter notebook that I prepared. But basically you see, while I'm talking, this loads, and now we will see the exact environment that you have been shown earlier this week. This is a Jupyter notebook. You can do anything in it via a browser, including modifying the code, playing with the figures, downloading everything and re-executing. So, I think this is like a flagship NeuroLibre publication. And fortunately, the journal MRM agreed, they published it. And uh, we've had other journals also publish some of these notebooks. So I think there is something there. It's worth the time when you have tenure to you know, build something that hopefully shows the way forward. Um, so uh, let's go back. I think I convinced you that paper is not enough, at least for some technical MRI research. Uh, but uh, then what is enough? Well, we're trying to develop the ecosystem that makes it easy to do quantitative MRI. And there's a tool called QMR Lab. Uh, this uh, started out as my very first article when I became faculty. Uh, and uh, basically, eventually, we published it in JOS, the Journal of Open Source Software. Uh, I think Ariel might have handled it, actually, when I think of it. Uh, so uh, again, it's not a paper. It's software. It has a DOI. It started out as something that we published in 2015 called QMT Lab. It was for magnetization transfer. It also came from Montreal, hence MTL right here. It was also in MATLAB. So, you know, like a triple abbreviation. Um, and this is the interface. This is what it looks like. And uh, I thought that it was going to give a 45 minute talk, but I was told that I have an hour and a half. So I just went down memory lane and I'm going to show you some videos that we made for QMR Lab. I think they're fun. I think they set the stage for what I'm trying to do. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's, I'm not gonna keep you here too long. So this is my student, Aga. I love them doing analogies for quantitative MR, so. Hello everyone. In the next magnetic moments, I will explain you why MRI numbers is different than the regular MRI and how our tool, QMR Lab, makes it easy to use. Every MRI image is a symphony. And just like a symphony, the image is composed of many parts. Each of those parts is a complex melody played by different instruments. Let's hear one of our favorites, the Brain Symphony. Symphonies are pleasant to listen to, but only a skilled conductor can tell when one of the instruments is out of tune. That is why it is important to break down the music into the individual instrument solos. Wouldn't it be easier for them to hear each instrument separately? And this is where MRI with numbers comes to our help. Think of a magic hat, where you can put regular MRI images in, cast some magic spells, and produce a separate music sheet for each instrument. This is what MRI with numbers does. From these music sheets, we can create a solo for each instrument. 
Let's hear the symphony again, but this time each instrument will play one by one. When conductors hear each instrument playing a solo, they can better understand if the instrument is playing well. Scientists like solos too, because with solos, they can compare different brains and identify parts that are not working well. But there is a problem. The brain symphony is composed of many different instruments, lots of different melodies, and there are many tricks to being a conductor. Some of the tricks are too difficult and some of them are hidden. And sometimes the conductors don't tell each other their tricks. To solve this problem, we created a magical hat, which makes MRI with numbers easy to use, QMR Lab. We can feed regular MR images in the QMR Lab hat, make it easy to perform the trick, and then produce a solo music sheet for each of the instruments contributing to the image. Listening to solos instead of symphonies will make the life of doctors and scientists easier. Also, it will make it simpler to decide if there is something wrong with your brain and to see if your brain improved after the doctor treated it. This is actually difficult because not even the best conductor has mastered all of the tricks the brain can play on us. Don't forget, these symphonies are written by the most amazing composer your brain. So this was uh, one of the, again, early QMR lab videos we made. Uh All right, so I apologize. It looks like uh, I got crashed my computer, uh, but uh, we're back online. I think you can all hear me. Can you please give me a thumbs up? Yes, okay, good. And uh, now let's see what I can uh, restart here. Don't forget to share your screen. Yep, uh, so PowerPoint crashed too, wow. And I did restart my computer right before yeah. this because I was worried this might happen, but. <laughs> All right, uh, back to where I was. QMR Lab, symphonies. There you go. And I'm going to share my screen now. Like that. And I'm going to show you the QMR Lab web page. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so uh, you can download it. It runs in MATLAB. There is also an Octave version if you want to use it free. Um, and uh, you can simulate, fit, and visualize data. Uh, and you can also read different kinds of posts that explain what uh, QMR Lab does and why it is important. Some of them are kind of fun, you know, talk about the other analogies. I make my students come up with analogies for quantitative MRI all the time. But others are more kind of like, how can you run it in a Jupyter notebook for Windows? Uh, or, uh, you know, what can you do to uh, uh, measure the T1 parameter with a sequence called MP2 rage, for example? So there is a blog. The blog is written by my students. There's also pretty extensive documentation. So uh, you can take a look here at the documentation. Uh, lots of uh, different guidelines on how to install using a graphical user interface, using uh, uh, batch scripts. And uh, there's also our GitHub page, which uh, you know is pretty popular. People use it. It has about 150 stargazers. And uh, I, think, I think it's doing good uh, for the community. Now, what does QMR Lab look like? Uh, let me just guide you very, very quickly through another video that a student of mine made. Uh, but this one, I'm just going to slowly move. You know, like these are the problems that we face. We have the problems of reproducibility, user experience, and documentation. 
we're trying to put quantitative MRI under one umbrella. Lots of different methods are available under this umbrella. Uh, it's open source, uh, collaborative, modular, pretty easy to run. Uh, and this is what the interface looks like. Uh, basically, you can load data, you can zoom on it, uh, you can uh, do different kinds of sensitivity analysis, alter parameters to perform the fits, multi-voxel distributions. Uh, this is all a graphical user interface, but you can also use it in a console. And uh, I think it's very well supported. So if anybody wants to use quant quantitative MR MRI, QMR Lab is one way to do it. And our vision was quantitative MRI under one umbrella. And this happened in 2016. Uh, in the meantime, lots of other things popped up <laughs> from other umbrellas, uh, which is great uh, because we still think there is a way to make all of these interoperable. And one way to do it is by developing data standards. There is the BIDS data standard, which, uh, uh, as you know, started uh, with uh, Russ Poldrak, Chris Golgolevsky, and a team around uh, that group. Uh, but recently, it's expanded into different extension proposals, including the very first extension proposal for quantitative MRI. And this was led by Aga Karakuzu, same person who is in my lab. And we think that this is a way for all of these different packages to talk to each other. Because again, we do need these standards. We do need to make sure that the data can be interoperable between different platforms. So how do we write a paper? Well, it's not just a PDF. I told you that much. On the surface, it's like a planet where you have lots of different uh, uh, analysis, data visualizations, and interactive reporting. But underneath, there is a lot of tools that keep this going, including many that were introduced uh, the past two days. There's the processing of the data. There's uh, lots of different tools to do that. FSL, FMI Prep, Free Surfer, QMR Lab. Uh, there's also quality control. There's lots of tools for that. Uh, but there's also the reconstruction aspect. And this is something that you may not be very aware of, that MRI images come from something called K-space. So basically, what you get out of the scanner is a Fourier transform of the brain. And uh, somebody needs to make sure that that Fourier transform is sufficiently well reconstructed. Uh, and there's lots of tools that can do that as well. But then what is actually at the core? So I would say that it's standards, bids being one of them. How many know of bids? OK, great. How many of you know about the ISMRM raw data standard, MRD? Way fewer. Basically, these two are completely different. ISMRM raw data is about the case-based data, what comes out of the scanner. And then BIDS is about after you reconstruct the data, what you do with it. So if you're not aware of MRD, you're missing kind of half the story of how these images are generated. And then there's the pulse sequences. How many of you have programmed a pulse sequence? I'm curious. Okay. Again, I, I understand that this is not many. So I will try to sensitize you to it. Okay. I'm not going to teach you how to write a pulse sequence. I'm just going to tell you it's really important. So what do we do? Well, we try to create container mediated workflows that start with the acquisition, the pulse sequence, go through the reconstruction, the quality control, the processing, and the statistics and visualization. We do it using a tool called NextFlow. Anybody familiar with it? Okay, so NextFlow is kind of an industry standard for connecting containers. Ariel will talk about them tomorrow. But basically, it's a way to ensure that the environment is as reproducible as possible. And this is data-driven, meaning that once the data arrives, the processing happens automatically. So what we do is we connect the data standards, ISMRM raw data and bids, with containers, the next flow and, uh, 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 engine, QMR lab, to create something called QMR flow. So all of these tools are complicated in themselves. You tie them together. There could be lots of problems. But we did develop an ecosystem called Venus for vendor-neutral sequences, where we made this work. And I think we made quantitative MRI better in the process. It's a collaboration with a company. It's called Hard Vista. It's at Stanford University. Uh, Bill and Juan are uh, uh, former PhD students in the same lab where I finished my PhD. Uh, Bob and John are faculty. John was my PhD supervisor. And they built this system that can bypass the proprietary nature of scanners. So this is the Montreal Heart Institute where I do my scanning. This is a 3T Siemens Skyra that we have installed. And what we've done is we've installed this new software called RT Hawk, created by the company HardVista, that bypasses anything proprietary on the Siemens system. So I can take a sequence, put it on GitHub, install it on RT Hawk, and acquire an image. 
Now you may be wondering, why does that matter? In reality, it matters because then Siemens cannot change anything behind my back. I control the sequence. Even more beautifully, I can take that same sequence and I can deploy it on another scanner, a Siemens scanner or a GE scanner. And that's exactly what we did. And we had QMR lab running on top of everything to make sure that the processing is as uniform as possible. So here's the sequence. Uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, you can go to this link to check out how everything works. Uh, it is also available as a Neural Libre publication. And this is the experiment we did. Three scanners, one G, two Siemens, with the native sequences and the vendor neutral sequences. And our hypothesis was we should do better. If we do this the right way with maximum transparency, the results should be closer together. And fortunately, that's exactly what happened. Uh, so this is, again, work in MRM. Uh, won a lot of awards for Aga. I think it really kind of made his career. Um, and uh, the nice thing is that the vendor neutral implementation works really well in phantoms. So you see here, these are the actual values in the phantoms. The crosses are very close to the red and the orange. That is our measurement. The blue measurements are from the vendor specific implementations and they actually get the numbers slightly wrong. And you take a look at brains, which is what we really care about. The native implementations between GE and Siemens, you see the difference, right? Like this is a very different brain compared to this one, even though it's the same subject. And then we run it through our vendor neutral implementation and the brains are becoming much closer. So maybe there is hope. We calculated the coefficient of variance and we saw that T1, magnetization transfer and empty sat, these are three different quantitative MRI parameters. Big variability in the native implementations, not so much in the vendor neutral implementation. This holds across subjects and within individual subjects. And we reduce the variability by about 60 to 70%. Now, the results are good, they're convincing, but it takes more than that to convince vendors to change their way. Uh, because this would require them to disclose a lot of the things they do. And I would be you know, very happy to answer questions because we have some very concrete explanations of what is happening after an upgrade and why these values change so much. Our vision, you could do MRI with one line of code. Doesn't mean that you don't have to understand everything that goes in there, but at least a lot of the variability is reduced. And this is what you can do with QMR Lab. How many of you have heard of this uh, essay, The Cathedral in the Bazaar? Okay. It's very famous, uh, again, for, for people who have been following the evolution of Linux. Uh, Eric Raymond uh, wrote about uh, how Linux developed and how it was different from Unix. So basically, uh, Linux really incorporated different kinds of contributions. Didn't matter whether they approved it or not. They would say, develop for Linux, and then we'll create a release that will have a lot of the user contributions in the system, which is very different from the way that Unix was running things. And uh, you could talk about a cathedral approach and you can talk about a bazaar approach. The cathedral approach would be the Unix way. The, the bazaar would be the Linux way. The cathedral approach would be, I don't know, Microsoft or Apple. The bazaar approach would be uh, any open source solutions. But interestingly, in this essay, the one software that gets the most uh, good reputation is MATLAB. And Raymond says MATLAB does it right. They have a proprietary language, but they have a big user base, a big community, and they develop for MATLAB and then gets incorporated. Of course, it is closed source, but it is a bizarre model of development, which again, first time I read it was a big uh, surprise. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop a bazaar for MRI. Uh, Aga and I wanted to call it an MR bazaar. I think it sounds cool. It's also kind of Middle Eastern. We're both from that part of the world. Uh, but our colleague said, you know, it maybe sounds too chaotic. So call it MRI fair. It sounds a little more Western. Um, so there you go. It's the MRI fair. It's the vendor neutral app store. And uh, the vision is that we can create an app for different kinds of quantitative MRI routines so that when you want to implement a myelin imaging protocol or a G ratio protocol, you will deploy it on this app store. And then anybody who uses Siemens or G or Philips will be able to download it and run it themselves. 
you can imagine that you know there is lots of roadblocks here, but technically this is very feasible. And just to show how feasible it is, we created a project called MP2 Rage Against the Machine, uh, scanning in the name of reproducibility uh, with PulseSeq and Venus. Uh, so PulseSeq is a standard, kind of like how QMRI bids is a standard for data. PulseSeq is a standard for pulse sequences, and it runs on Siemens, Philips, G, and Canon. So I spent two months in Japan, and fortunately, they actually have all four of these vendors in a hospital, Juntendo Hospital in Tokyo. And we were able to acquire MP2 Rage data. These are T1 maps. And we showed that actually they're much closer than the MP2 Rage implementations for the native uh, sequences. Now, this work is still in progress. Uh, it will be presented at the SMRMB in Barcelona as an oral. I really hope that we will be able to share more about it very soon. But then we come to the dissemination part. And as much as this is about QMRI, I really have to talk about publishing. Uh, partly because it's the battle I've chosen to fight uh, in the last five or six years, but also because hopefully it will show you how you can be part of that battle uh, with quantitative MRI. So first, a blog post. We wrote this in PLOS in 2017, 18. Uh, JB's on this, uh, myself. Uh, Dylan Roskam's address, and uh, I think it was just the three of us. Uh, and basically, we wrote about the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform catching up to Plan S and going further. Uh, and in it, we spoke about you know the published article just being the tip of the iceberg, and there are many, many things underneath it. And we said, here's a recipe for reproducible analysis. Put your code on GitHub, make the data publicly available somewhere, containerize the environment. Again, that's coming tomorrow and then create these interactive plots and analysis using Jupyter Notebooks and call that NeuroLibre, neurolibre.org. It's up, it's running. We're going to stress test it in a bit. What does a NeuroLibre publication look like? Well, kind of like what I showed you. Layer one, a PDF compatible document. You just print it out and read it, fine. Layer two, dynamic figures. The data is there, you can explore it. Layer three, interactive figures. You can actually change different parameters and you can explore a phenomenon. Level four, you can see the code that generated these figures, so maximum transparency. And level five, reproducibility, you can actually run the code that generates the outputs. And we wrote this, it was public, and then we were approached by the authors of this book, Quantitative Magnetic Resonance Imaging, Volume 1. It's about 1,000 pages, and they wanted us to write a chapter about T1 mapping. And we said, well, the chapter is already written, but it's a blog post, and it's public, and you're free to use it, but you have to put that it's under a Creative Commons license. And I think this was a first because they did publish it and they did put a Creative Commons license with a footnote that these sections are available. So this book is about $250, I think. One chapter is free because we published under a Creative Commons license. But this inspired us because I think that this chapter can really drive the way for teaching people quantitative MRI. So I told you I was on sabbatical. Part of it was this raging against the machine stuff. But there was also an attempt to create a MOOC. Now, MOOC usually stands for Massive Open Online Course. In this case, I think it's going to be a mini open online course, but it's still a MOOC. And uh, let me just play this video to show you how we're going to do it. My inspiration is the Dwight Nishimura book on MRI. If you've seen it, it's about 150 pages. And it's just the easiest book to read and many generations have been trained on it. So I want to create an interactive book about QMRI that is easy to read fast and hopefully gets you the basics. Um, a lot of it is from the PhD thesis of Aga Karakuzu, who, who has spirit and uh, he's using jelly bean analogies and he's talking about quantum mechanics as a way for computers to date and lots of cool things that I think would make reading this book interesting. Uh, but don't be fooled by the cuteness of it. I think it's actually technologically very sound. First, it is using the MIST format, the MIST markdown. How many of you are aware of it? Basically, MIST is the next generation for Jupyter Books. So as you see, it's way more interactive in line. You can hover over things. It will load previews. It will load equations. It will make it easier to connect different parts that are hyperlinked through the document. 
And then there is that whole thing about, you know, the data and the code being available. Now, I'm kind of scared about this part, but I said we're going to try it, and Aga knows that we might crash his Neural Libre server, okay? But I need to know how this is going to run. So there's a QR code, and I was hoping that you could either load a QR code from your phone or type that address that's at the bottom. And I have to warn you, most likely at some point, things will crash. But if we are to teach a massive open online course, I need to know how massive it can be. And I also want to show you, hopefully, how easy it will be to rerun this analysis. So I'm going to take that graph, uh, sorry, that link. Okay, so I apologize to our online audience. For some reason, whenever I exit the sharing, my computer restarts. Uh, it hasn't happened before, but uh, I tried to test it. I thought it was going to work fine. Uh, the challenge is still on. I want you to go to that link that I will just put now again. So I'm going to share my screen, share the sound. Okay. And uh, let's go here. So was anybody able to load, by the way, or was it too short? Okay, so did the Jupyter Notebook, oh, so so you have the document up there. Okay, perfect. So no. now no. Yeah. let's try something that no. uh, is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I'm not sharing, sorry. Yeah, I think I am, I think I am, yeah. Okay. So uh, how many of you, sorry, I'm just looking at the audience in the room, but hopefully online you can do it too. How many of you are on this page? Okay, great. Now what I want you to do is I want you to start a binder instance. Now, each sorry, of the... Uh, Where did that come from? I, was there a question maybe or... Uh, we're unmuted, okay. So I want you to launch Binder. Maybe let's increase the rotation. Okay, this one, let's see if I can mute them. Uh, that's, that's the other one. Yes, that's the problem. So I said we can go for two seconds, now it's going faster. So that one's actually supposed to be good. This account. Yeah, but I think we should move this up. Set up speed curve and okay. So okay. each of these uh, will launch a binder instance uh, with about an eight gigabyte partition. So we're probably going to crash it, but give it a try. Let's see what happens. And if it loads, I want you to raise a hand. So basically, these are images. Okay, I have one hand up. That's great. Uh, these are images of the T1 book that are currently being loaded via a Docker container. And this is very different from what your Jupyter Hub does. Okay, so you have the Jupyter Hub. The Jupyter Hub is a way to enable people running notebooks without wasting the resources of their computer. But this is slightly different. This is actually deploying a fully containerized version of a paper that is executing on our servers in Montreal, and it is actually being displayed via a browser so that you can interact with it without any kind of Jupyter Hub uh, instance happening here in uh, Washington. Question on yes. Zoom. Question on Zoom. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Melanie, please go ahead. Oh, no, not a question. Just saying it loaded. <laughs> okay, perfect. That was a hands up. Thank you. So loaded for me. How many more? Wow. Is anybody still hanging? Okay, so more than half, right? <laughs> uh, so what's the message that you get uh, when it's hanging? It's still just kind of the circles are turning. We haven't crashed anything yet. 
Now there's an error. How many got an error? Okay, others are still hoping. So I have to say, I'm very happy because we're not even in beta, okay? So I will tell you more about that. But this was just me and Aga saying, let's try it, see what happens, because we're gonna, it's the first time we're announcing this to, you know, 100 people. Nothing dramatic happened yet. I think it's still running. <laughs> uh, any any more people that actually got it uh, to load? Wow, cool. So what about the Zoom folks? I'm not sure if I can see you well, but uh, I have I see some more raised hands. So Mohammed, it seems like it ran. Melanie, Megan. I would call this a success, given that this technology doesn't exist at the moment. You know, we're really trying to build it from scratch using all of these open source tools. But uh, I'm pretty happy because Binder is usually used for analysis. We're trying to use it for publishing. And uh, I would say, you know, it's doable. And we would like to teach courses using uh, this technology. So a mini open online course, I think that will work just fine. Uh, so thank you for indulging me. This really means a lot. I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, we, we didn't crash anything. And uh, imagine this is on the Edurome network at the University of Washington, accessing servers in Montreal. Uh, actually, in a couple of months, it will be a federation. We will have servers in Japan, in Macedonia, and most likely in the Emirates. So then we will actually cover all of the planet Earth. And then hopefully, you know, the delays are going to be even smaller and we'll be able to distribute a lot of these requests. So uh, I think exciting things are coming. And uh, I know a couple of you will be at this event that we're organizing. I'll tell you if you want to join us uh, either, on either online or in person. All right. So I think it's time to slowly bring this home. Um, so you saw the MOOC. Now this is a pitch for Neurolibre. Uh, looks like at every annual ISMRM meeting, one of our abstracts is uh, you know, selected as a top abstract. Uh, we usually don't submit too many. Uh, but then we also built some notebooks for other journals. This is the journal PLOS Computational Biology. I have a team in Macedonia. It's called the Notebook Factory. Uh, the people working on it are called Oompa Loompas, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So the Oompa Loompas make these uh, uh, notebooks, and then we publish them in different journals. PLOS decided to do a survey based on these notebooks, and they asked us to write an editorial on the open source landscape of PLOS Computational Biology. And, you know, again, we analyzed how many papers share Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, in 2021, it was about 20%. So I think that number is growing. We also build notebooks for the journal MRM, Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. We have um, um, a website called MRPub, where you can download a lot of these publications. And there's been examples of actual publications in Wiley, PLOS, eLife, Elsevier, and Aperture Neuro, the OHBM journal, using the Neurolibre preprints. Now we but uh, completely free. And we want to create kind of like a new version of archive that actually makes it easy for you to interact with a publication. As you can imagine, that comes with a cost, the cost of hosting, but also who's going to review these things. Okay. So I have answers to that, but you know, it's out of the scope of this lecture. But what's important is the community aspect. We really need to build a community around this. So while I'm not writing papers, I'm trying to do that. Uh, this is a journal that we publish. It's a magazine. It's really nice, glossy, beautiful. Uh, gets published once a year. It's called MRM Highlights. Uh, we interview luminaries in the field. Uh, the first interview was with Erwin Hahn. Erwin Hahn is the father of the spin echo. Uh, and uh, a couple of months after he did the interview, he actually passed on. So this was the last interview he gave. And uh, it meant a lot that we preserved his story. Uh, John Tanner, he's the father of diffusion. Stayskill and Tanner, okay, he's the Tanner in that paper. Uh, passed away last year, but we organized a conference for him. And uh, he was very happy that he got this recognition from the ISMRM community. Al Makovsky is still alive and kicking, uh, 96 now. And I'm going to go see him in a couple of days back at Stanford. So uh, he's also interviewed for highlights. Uh, Joanne Engwell, uh, the first uh, woman gold medalist for the ISMRM. And then we also uh, publish interviews with authors and we publish something called reproducible research insights. Articles in MRM that have a reproducibility component, we talk to them and ask them to explain what they did and why they did it that way. And then we published another Neurolibre preprint 
It's called Reproducible Research Practices in MRI. It's for a Japanese journal, Magnetic Resonance in Medical Sciences. And uh, it's fun because we created this Sakura map and uh, we asked a uh, uh, clustering algorithm to you know, group MR papers based on themes. And it actually did identify a cluster that had to do with their producibility in MRI. And basically these are the papers that we have highlighted in the journal MRM. So we took these papers and the interviews on those papers and we created a custom GPT. So now there is a custom GPT right here that you can interact with and ask questions. Uh, so again, this was fun to make, took a lot of time, but uh, you know it's something that hopefully gets people to understand the way that all of these new tools can interact with each other to create more fun publications. That's always my hope. And uh, speaking of fun, we organize events. We organize a hackathon for MRI professionals. This is different from the OHBM hackathon. This is more affiliated with the ISMRM. Uh, this happened in Montreal in 2019. Then we had a pandemic, but fortunately we came back. This was uh, uh, in 2023 in uh, Toronto, uh, in a Masonic temple. We had a lot of fun there. And then this was in the Jackie Chan house in uh, Singapore, a beautiful old uh, wooden house at the University uh, for uh, Technology and Design, I think, in Singapore. Uh, and again, we hope to keep it going. I think it's nice for community building. Uh, a lot of the people that were highlighted in this work previously come to these events and hopefully the event keeps growing. And finally, something that we are about to announce, it's not official yet, uh, but it's called NeuroLibre Day. The idea is that finally, now we're ready to put NeuroLibre in beta. And probably it's not gonna be called NeuroLibre anymore. We're thinking of a new name because we think that neuro just turns people away. This server should serve many different kinds of disciplines. Uh, it will happen on September 27th. Uh, you will see the usual NeuroLibre suspects uh, here because you know we've been working on this for many years, but also the members of the NeuroLibre Federation, uh, Juntendo University in Tokyo, UKIM, uh, the University of Sincerely and Methodius in Macedonia, my home country, uh, and NYU Abu Dhabi, as well as Peter Banditini, who is currently the editor-in-chief of Aperture Neuro, the OHVM journal, uh, Peter Jezer, who is the editor-in-chief of MRM. Uh, and then we'll also have representatives from eLife, from PLOS, uh, and uh, hopefully from Elsevier. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So we think it's a good time to just start talking about this. If you want to join us, uh, the event is open for registration. Registration is free. In person would be better. But if you want to join on Zoom, you'll have a day where publishers and uh, open science advocates will talk about how we can publish MRI research better. So to summarize, uh, MRI research, in particularly quantitative MRI research is like a hurdle race. You have to jump through the hurdle of data acquisition and then data pre-processing and then analysis and finally you publish your article. We wanna make it more like a sprint where we combine vendors, uh, startups uh, that are uh, you know, developing in the MRI space, uh, open source software, and open source publishing tools to create a nice quantitative MRI workflow. So I want to thank my lab, my collaborators. This is a little bit of an old picture. We haven't had a new one since the pandemic, but uh, Aga's there, uh, he's still with me. He's uh, responsible for many of the developments that I've shown you. Uh, and that there's also Julian Cohen Haddad. He's the co-PI in my lab, uh, author of the Spinal Cord Toolbox, if some of you are using it. Uh, basically our lab is very big on open source and we hope that some of you will decide to talk to us. Uh, this is my email address if you want to uh, reach me. Um, this is a Monopoly joke. The name of our lab is Neuropoly. So you collect your degree and then you come and work for us. Um, this is me on social media. So feel free to follow me anywhere. You can also sign up for the blog that I showed you. Uh, would be great to hear from you any way I can. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for questions. And sorry for crashing Zoom so many times. Yes. Uh, so, who is moderating? Am I uh, unmuting them? Uh, actually, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. That was amazing. I feel like a lot of what you're saying really resonated. Um, 
with me with some of the challenges that I've experienced at the moment, we're trying to work with multiple sites um, with different vendors. And it's been a really big struggle to try to standardize the sequences across the sites. Um, so I was really excited to hear about your efforts with Venus and the pulse sequence standard. Um, what sort of sequences are available? Is it very specific to qMRI or do you have stuff like diffusion and like ASL or are there plans to do that in the future? Yeah, so um, several ways to answer this. Um, if you have the RT Fox system, there's big flexibility. And even if the sequence doesn't exist, we can build it pretty quickly. Only problem is, again, RT Hawk is proprietary. We deploy GitHub sequences, but it's not cheap. The alternative is this PulseSeq approach, and that's what we used in Japan. But for that one, it takes more effort to develop. So currently, the only one that we have available is the sequence MP2 Rage. It is a PulseSeq standard. It could be deployed on any of the, on the systems that support PulseSeq. And I hope that other groups will start developing these quantitative MRI routines. So at the moment, it's just MP2 Rage, but nothing prevents people from developing more. And you don't have to have RT Hawk. You don't have to pay anything to be able to run these sequences. That's awesome. I'm really looking forward to hopefully like more stuff being developed in that space in the future. The one thing though, that in my experience I've encountered so far is that the clinical sites are very resistant to anything. <laughs> so I feel like that's like one of the hurdles is I'm hoping that the clinical sites will hopefully adopt something like this in the future, but yeah, definitely a challenge still at this moment. As they say, you know, every uh, new development, it's 20% technical and 80% social. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the nice thing is that the RT Hawk system that I told you about is FDA approved. It's okay. FDA approved for cardiac applications, and that's why it's expensive, because it is actually mm -hmm. used in hospitals. So we have two solutions. One is the expensive one that, you know, I know not many sites will have. The other one is fully free, but it will have this regulatory, regulatory problem. So by all means, you're, you're right, and hospitals are resistant. Vendors also are resistant. But for a long time, it was like, you know, you're never going to make that work. Of course, quantitative MRI is going to vary by 30%. Now we say, no, not really. And vendors are not making money from quantitative MRI. That's the other thing. At the moment for them, they develop these things. Nobody's buying them. Nobody believes it. So I think it's a new market that they have to learn how to exploit. And I think an app store, kind of like how, you know, it used to be about the phone, iPhone or Android. And now it's much more about, can I run Viber on both? I think that's what they need to realize. And I think they could make money by adopting these standards. Yeah, it's really exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Another question from Angelina. Yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Right. And thanks a lot for a very fascinating talk, Nicole. Really, that was eyes opening. Uh, fellow Bulgarian here. So I, I actually. So. Have a yeah, we have a broken about... connection. <laughs> Yeah, we do. I was actually very interested about the this Balkan net that you mentioned and your effort to try and bring together people based basically in our part of the world. And also I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how our part of the world is lagging behind if it is. I mean, of course, technology affordances is a big thing. So of course, I think that's one of the reasons why things are not as they are in, in the West. Uh, but still, I would be happy to hear your thoughts on this. So this is something that we started in 2008. Uh, I was still a uh, graduate student then. And again, advice for some of you that are, you know, at that stage, making these contacts early pays off in spades later on. That's how I got my postdoc. That's how I got some name recognition. And once you can get going, it's much easier. You don't need papers then. Uh, but uh, Angelina, uh, we started in Macedonia with two conferences, 2008 and 2011. Uh, and this was my hope to bring MRI research in the Balkans. It's not easy. It's very difficult because we have the equipment, we don't have the personnel. And uh, they will invest a lot of money in the infrastructure, but then having somebody to actually do the, 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 the human training is very challenging. So I was yeah. not able to get it going in Macedonia, but uh, we did organize a couple of more things. In Bulgaria, it's Bogdan Dragansky who helped. He's in uh, Lausanne at the moment. And uh, I know that he had very good contacts with the hospital in Sofia. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. So uh, I really hope that we can do another one that's going to be hopefully now with all of these small networks being formed. Just, you know, let's get together and talk because it's not a problem of the money for the scanner. It's really more a problem. How can we convince the players in that region that we could do cutting edge MRI research uh, from there? Because they don't believe us. They're like, ah, you know, you're, you're just fooling yourself. I honestly think that if we have a coordinated effort, we could start some really cool studies in the Balkans. 
and there's upsides to it, meaning uh, students who are really eager to get involved in international projects, uh, cheap labor force, which again, maybe we shouldn't advertise, but it is true, and it would greatly benefit the Balkans. Uh, and also regulations are different than in the rest of the world. Uh, it's not part of the European Union, and sometimes that's a good thing, not always, but sometimes it's just easier, you know, less GDPR issues and so on. So I would love to talk to you. I think it would be great to coordinate a little and create a critical mass. Thank you so much. Best of luck with all your projects. Really fascinating work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so JB and... Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always beautiful talks. Uh, Nicolas, Thank you. Always extremely uh, well uh, uh, communicative and fantastic. Uh, uh, I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit more on the way you think you can sustain things and uh, if you have uh, a bit more information on that. Yeah. Next, the next few not quite a bit different. So, as you know, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get money for software. I think you're all aware of it. And if you're not, you will become aware of it very soon. Um, now, uh, there's QMR Lab and there's Neurolibre. In my head, they're connected, but maybe I can talk about you know those two different aspects. Uh, the QMR Lab development, it's not very expensive. You know, It's something that uh, we've done in our lab. There's always uh, students that want to contribute. And I think our user base is uh, growing, but not at a pace that we can't keep up with it. Uh, and also, we don't promise to provide any kind of support, uh, even though we do, until now, there hasn't been anybody who's been ignored. Our lab maintains four software uh, packages. Uh, the Spinal Cord Toolbox, that one is the most popular, Julian Conadad. The Shiming Toolbox, that's Eva Alonso Ortiz. Uh, uh, QMR Lab, and I'm missing one, sorry, Benjamin, I will remember which one it is. So uh, these are the, 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 the four packages that have gone on for a long time. It's a small community. I don't think we'll have a problem with scaling. And usually, you know, it's a good way to establish collaborations. And sometimes collaborators just pay part of a salary or some kind of a consulting fee. So I think that's very doable. It's not very computationally intensive. We are talking about a collaboration with MATLAB so that maybe we can put a lot of these things online with a free license, because that is an issue. And if we had to give free licenses for MATLAB, that would not be sustainable. But that's why we maintain a Octave version, which is slower, but, you know, circumvents that problem. Now I get to Neurolibre and this, you know, this is a serious issue. And uh, Neurolibre is computationally intensive. It requires significant infrastructure. All of that infrastructure is located in Montreal at the moment at McGill. So it's a single point of failure. And uh, it's on a grant that hasn't been renewed. So we're hoping that it will, but at the moment we're really just kind of, you know, showing what can be done as a proof of concept. Uh, the nice thing is that the federation that we're building actually puts in resources in this. So the Japanese are the farthest ahead. They actually gave us a server and Aga is setting it up and we think that it will be up and running by September 27th. The Macedonians are also giving the server, but they don't have as much of technical equipment, so you know, technical expertise, so we need to go and work with them. And I think that will reduce a little bit of the load from the Montreal site. Uh, NYU Abu Dhabi has a lot of data restrictions. Basically, the Emirates are very restrictive about what comes out of there, uh, but they do have the most money. <laughs> so uh, I think between these four, we can build a sustainable governance system. And this is what we want to do with the Neurolibre Day. Basically say, you know, it's free. It has been free. I want it to stay free. And that infrastructure will need some support either from some philanthropy organizations or from universities. So this is a big issue. The reason we're doing this Neural Libre Day is to just kind of get that conversation started to see how can we maintain it. Long-term, maybe journals that actually use the Neural Libre ecosystem can contribute a portion of their APCs because the article processing charges are about $3,000, which is ridiculous. Maintaining a Neural Libre preprint, $10 per article, that would be plenty. So. It does scale. There's not a problem of, you know, if we have a thousand articles, we can still handle it, but we do need something that can support it uh, in a more sustainable way. So absolutely. You want to follow up on that? No, no, I was thinking like, you know, if there's also a company that is being thought of, you know, that, uh, Sure. So it is, it is important to be a bit Of course, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, here, so 
I want Neuro Libre to stay free for everybody. Now, full disclosure, I want to start a journal. I actually want to start a for-profit journal. That would be the best way to, you know, show publishers how it's done. And if this journal happens, nothing would make me happier than that journal actually contributing to Neuro Libre. Uh, but at the moment, I just want to keep those things separate. So let's build Neuro Libre first. Let's have a good beta release. Let's show that it works and then take it from there. And sorry, behind JB. Thanks. I'm really excited to hear about Neuro Libre Day. And I, um, you mentioned in your excitement potentially about it kind of going past nurses as well, like the same combination of other disciplines. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your hopes and dreams of that are um, as far as what you you could foresee in the future. Yeah, so first, uh, I, I have to say, uh, we're not the only ones thinking about publishing with Jupyter Notebooks, okay? So it turns out that the geologists are quite ahead on this. They actually have a nice community that they're building. It's called Notebooks Now. There's also a company called Curve Note, uh, which uh, is a Y Combinator supported company uh, that tries to innovate in terms of uh, you know format. They actually have a great designer that's developing a lot of the features. And they're also contributing to the MIST format, the MIST markdown format. So already there's you know different communities who are aware of this. The problem, none of them can get more than 10 publications. We have 12 on NeuroLibre. Uh, there's also Stencila, which is a company that works with eLife. And eLife has had the ERAs, executable research articles for, I don't know, 10 years maybe? Long time. Researchers are not submitting. Now, we could discuss a lot about why that is, but partly the incentives are not there. I mean, why would you spend years building a research article when in reality you just need that long list to show so you get promoted or hired or whatever? So I think it needs to come kind of, you know, from a more grassroots perspective. You develop some really cool articles that get noticed, and then hopefully people realize that this is one way to get noticed. Because again, my, my story, I try to practice what I preach is, I've just always tried to develop articles that I think will attract attention because they're different. And NeuroLibre articles are different. Uh, which field will catch on first, I don't know, but it's not just neuroscience that's thinking about it. What we do require is some coordination between all of these different organizations because uh, we've been very neuroscience oriented and it's tough, you know, it's not a big community. Uh, so uh, if you know of other communities that are interested, I would, I would love to hear. Zoom, yeah. Yes, Ashley. Hi, sorry, I have another question. I, um, like I said, it really resonated with me, the stuff, the stuff about like trying to standardize the sequences across sites. Um, something that has kind of shifted a little bit for me over time, I think, is when we first started to onboard new sites, um, we focused a lot on trying to standardize the sequences and match the parameters as closely as we possibly could. But then what we started to realize is that we were like starting to sacrifice data quality at a given site. Mm -hmm. So we've kind mm -hmm. of started to pivot more to instead just trying to like collect the best quality data that we can at each site rather than trying to be too strict about the standardization. Um, but I think you had mentioned when you guys uh, did a call um, for the different sites to collaborate and collect data, um, you had mentioned, I think, that you had reduced the variability when the sites collaborated more. I was wondering yeah. if you had examples of what type of information the sites shared to try to reduce right. that variability. Right. So uh, very often, it was the same person doing the scanning. Uh, so basically, you know, the, 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 the sites that had the, the, the smallest uh, delta was, uh, you know, the same person acquired the data. So, you know, there is a little bit of an art there. Now, other things are... Uh, there's also the issue of how, uh, which phantoms you use, because sometimes even though phantoms need to be standardized and they're endorsed by the NIST, uh, there is variability, there is drift. So using the same phantom, that helped a lot. And finally, uh, having a shared PDF protocol, that makes a big difference because the paper did not say anything of here's the PDF protocol from Siemens. The paper said, use this uh, uh, TR, use this TE, 
didn't talk much about the spoiling. So there are other parameters in the sequence that you have to set up that you know you need to circulate. So even that, just having a shared PDF that comes as part of a publication would go a long way. Now, if you ask me at the moment, and this is actually happening, a pulse seek implementation of a T1 mapping sequence is the right way to go because it's vendor agnostic, and then any site can try to implement that exact public uh, 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 pulse sequence. And the next challenge that uh, is going to happen will be with a cardiac MRI study group, and they will create an open source cardiac T1 mapping routine that will be available as a pulse seek standard for different sites to implement. Now, as we mentioned before, clinics and clinical research is not going to be uh, you know, possible with this, but as a proof of concept, that's the next step. Because if I have the pulse sequence description as a waveform, it's just that. I mean, it's not it's not anything more than that. It's really just like an audio waveform that you put out there so anybody sees exactly what their pulse sequence should look like. That's good enough. But again, not every site has the capability to do that. Yeah, that's super interesting. Thanks. Yep. Yes. The reaction from the vendors about <laughs> this open format. I mean, I imagine this is a threat to them. What, right. What's the reaction then? <laughs> I'm going live. <laughs> Screw it. Let's do it. Um, so I think they don't like it for all the wrong reasons. Um, maybe I'm a little too abrasive because uh, I put them on the spot. Uh, but I think it's more, they just don't don't see the, the, the profit in this way of doing things. So uh, running this RT Hawk system at the Heart Institute, Basically, RT Hawk said, we'll take any responsibility for any damage that happens. So, you know, vendors should feel free, you know, should not be responsible for damage caused by us. And we even had a quench at the Heart Institute. And I was very worried that I'm going to get blamed for it. Didn't happen. Siemens said, no, no, it was unrelated. They fixed it. So we have a very good relationship with Siemens on that site. The other two scanners were at the Sunnybrook in Toronto. Same thing. Already discussed with the vendors, easy. Now, when I, we showed that and I told vendors I want to have it at 10 more sites, that's when the pushback happened. It's like, you know, you play your thing, you know, it's fine at the Heart Institute, but trying to go large scale and industrializing this, uh, you know, RT Hawk is supposed to be only for heart. That's what they're FDA approved for. So why are you doing brain on RT Hawk? It's like, well, it's the exact same technology. Everything's the same. We could go through FDA when the time comes. No, no, they should stick to just cardiac. Uh, so this is the, you know, the, the resistance we get. It's already approved. It's a product that is being sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but somehow they just don't want to go that last step. Now they say PulseSeq. PulseSeq is great. It is, except PulseSeq requires a lot of knowledge for pulse sequence development to actually deploy it. And I can see it as a long-term solution. It would be good that the vendors adopt the standard, but we're not going to be running pulse seek sequences next week with the clinical quality. Uh, now, going forward, I see one vendor maybe jumping out and saying, yeah, you know, this is good. Let's create an app store. Because a Apple makes a lot of money from the app, from the, from the app store. <laughs> uh, they take a cut from everything that's happening. And I think a big reason why quantitative MRI hasn't entered the clinic is because we can't trust it. Uh, so now some dirty laundry from the upgrades. They changed the B1 mapping routine. So if you have a parallel transmit, they went from the double angle B1 mapping to the three dream sequence. And that's the reason these 30% happened after the upgrade. I don't know that. So we asked, they told us, but wouldn't it be great if there was a way to actually put it out there because they're not going to lose money by just changing the B1 mapping sequence. It's fine. As long as I know what you did, I can account for it. So this kind of lack of transparency is good for pictures. You give me a beautiful photo of a brain, I don't need to know what you did. But if you want to actually you know, give me a number, you better tell me what happened in the background because that upgrade really messed up our, mess, our, our images. So I think it's getting there. I think vendors will eventually realize that if they want to make quantitative MRI work, if they want to turn the MRI scanner into a measurement device, they have to do this. There's no other way. But there's all things, you know, like you, there needs to be a right time and place. You, you, you never, you, you can never force that. You push, they push back harder. 
Are they still dealing with the the Yes, please. Are they still dealing with the 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 Jamaican patent issues? Is that still like lingering, even though he has passed on? Ah, so I. I I I don't I can't say especially not on on Zoom because I I don't know. I my feeling is that a lot of that IP has expired and that it's probably just a historical thing. It just MRI scanners went in another direction because of that patent. But whether at the moment there's any IP issues, my feeling is no. Uh, but I I wouldn't know honestly. But it's a fascinating read. Like the relaxometry hype cycle. Uh, so Aga Karakuzu did a lot of research for his PhD thesis, and then we wrote that as a blog post. <laughs> and then somebody said, why don't you publish it as a paper? It's like, because they're going to butcher it. I want it exactly that way. And then Aga said, let's publish it, but only with a publisher that will not change a single period. <laughs> and we submitted to Frontiers. <laughs> and then we got reviews, and they were actually good reviews, and we were going to address them. But then Frontiers were too quick. They were like, no, nope, publish, give us the money. So it is the exact same thing that was on the blog and in Frontiers, even though the reviewer for Frontiers was actually very constructive. So uh, yeah, read that. It's fun. You can also cite it. It's an article now. <laughs> it's five o'clock. Exactly. All right. With that, we're done for today. And we'll start again at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Bye.